Good evening, folks, and welcome to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury, New Hampshire. I'm going to share with you a project that I've actually built for a former client, a new version of the serving tray that we did on a Shop Night Live. Larger dovetails, and they also wanted walnut, and they wanted the bottom to have some some kind of really nice rich figured wood. So I remembered that I had a piece of burl walnut and I said, okay, let me work on it. And um, I said, I'll thin up the sides. They wanted the sides thinner as well. So that presented a little bit of a problem. These sides are pretty thin as it is. They're seven sixteenths thick. So if you're gonna miter a corner, you know, if you go much thinner, you're gonna have a pretty thin, a light corner. So what I decided to do was to start with 7 16 thick material and taper the inside. So it came up at like a, came up to leave a 5 16 looking thickness on the top. So it would be heavy enough to accept the bottom panel. I could put a groove all in there and it would accept that. But at the top it would be only 5 16 so it would look cleaner lighter. Once I made that angle all around, I thought, hey, maybe I should make the handle a little different and have it come up and then have it roll over. So I have kind of a rolled out handle and I'll miter the corners and it's still going to be light. So I asked, would you mind if we put some splines in the corners? And that's the thing I'm going to talk about today is how I spline these corners. And I want to put something a little nicer. So I suggested ebony splines into a walnut serving tray that was mitered. So let me show you what I got. So you can see that burl walnut bottom. Really, I love that color. And you can see that I've got the mitered corners and look at those. Those are the uh, ebony splines there. And notice how the top edge is only 5 16 look at it compared to the other one so it presents a bit more elegance and you know formality and here's where I had that angle going and I decided to roll out to make the handle for that handle to roll out and be back I had to start with a three-quarter inch thick piece here where the long sides I only started with 7 16 we've got a bottom in there I veneered the bottom in straight grain walnut and essentially the bottom fits the same way as the other one but there's a lot of differences up here and let me just show you see the the way that handle rolls back and I rounded this and I did this differently I, I like that clean stop point there I have this come up and it kind of bends back and I left almost a scroll look I played around and did a little volute. It's like the side of a uh, violin, you know, that little carved circle. And I felt like it was going to be too, too decorative on an otherwise fairly plain um, piece. So I felt to do it just this way was just more modern or contemporary. You know, it didn't throw it back to that period. So, and then on the outside, you can see how how I left it, I undercut here, so it actually is curved here on the walnut and then with the handle. So that required some figuring out, but I do want to say when clamping up mitered corners, it can be a challenge. So here was my plan. I was going to miter all the corners and then glue in the base when everything was ready and just clamp it all up. It'd just be a flat butt joint. And then afterwards I would put in the splines and that would give more strength and rigidity to the corners. And I knew then I would know they aren't going to come apart. But when I did a dry run to clamp it up, I was just not comfortable with the way I had to clamp it and it's slipping a bit. Now there are a lot of different ways of clamping uh, mitered corners and I thought of using my angle blocks and all that. But I decided instead, probably the fastest, best way would be to put an internal spline in these corners. And I actually did that using this little domino. It was a little tricky, you know, to get that 
little angled domino in there. And it didn't take me long to figure it out. But I ended up with having to cut these down to be only three eighths of an inch long to go across that point. Now that served me two purposes. One, it strengthened the corners, but more than that, it made the glue up much simpler and lower stress because the corners stayed aligned pretty much. I got the glue in there. I could start my clamp in this direction and that piece didn't slip out. <laughs> you know, I started it lightly, lightly, and then I came with my clamp here and got it all snugged up. You know, it helps if you can get a spline in there and you're gonna make a fairly lightweight project or even if you're making any kind of box, it's nice to get splines in there. So I'm just gonna make a little demo box and we're gonna put in splines in the corners. I'm gonna show you how the, the process I made to do that. However, I know most of you don't have a domino and I didn't for a long time. The old domino was the biscuit joiner. Norm made that famous. And we're going to use the biscuit joiner to make our corners because those are much more affordable. But if you have a domino, the, this method works. After that, we'll do a quick spline We'll do a little ebony spline into the corner of our box. Let's see if we can make it for time. I decided just to cut some, I just got these cherry pieces that are about two and five eighths strong. So, and they're about 12 inches long. So I decided to just make a box. I already mitered the corners just with the, the Felder table saw blade over. I just use the crosscut sled. So you could do that on your own crosscut sled as well. If you feel confident in your chop saw being set up for cutting miters, uh, you could cut a nice clean miter as well. All right, so once you've got that, I, I had that all cut to length. And then um, you see, I always also put these grooves already in here. And that's because when I assembled the box, I decided I was gonna make it useful. So I'm gonna have a top and a bottom like this into my box. So I'll glue it up with a top and bottom and then we'll put some splines in and then I won't do it tonight, but it could be sawed off. So there's a lid, the lid will have one spline and then put an inside to the box and the lid will fit right down or you could, you know, you could put an interior in the box or you could just leave it, but it's a square box. So anyway, what we're going to do is put the spline in here. So let me get out the old Dewalt biscuit joiner. I want to put a biscuit right in to this end. So these things have settings on them where I could tip this over to a 45, you know, hold it like this and run the biscuit and change the height of the fence. But it, to me, it's always a little shaky, like to know and get it indexed correctly. So when I'm looking for more accuracy in some ways, I, I actually prefer to just leave this up and lock it in at a 90. And where possible, use the biscuit referencing off a flat surface. So if the sole of the, the biscuit joiner is on something flat and I can get my miter to index on the point there, I could get it referenced, if I can hold this thing at a 45, then I can just plunge right in. Super easy. I just do that on every corner. Now, how are we gonna set up to do that? I wish I had like a 45 degree plate. Oh, well, look at that. I got a 45 degree plate right over there. <laughs> but what I did here, I just made this some time ago, not for this particular thing. I can't remember what it was, but I was doing something and needed a 45 degree plate <laughs> and took some MDF and just cut the 45s on each piece. And you can see the joint right there. Just glued it up and I, I ran some tacks in there and then some cutoff pieces. I also had the 45 there and I just cut them and slid them in so they reinforced and held it at the true 45. So it's just some MDF you can make one of these and, and they are handy. They come in at different times. So now look at this. 
I also, for this, I pre put on this little cleat. This is not usually here, but I put a square on the bottom, had the cleat against the square, and held this piece up and came down. So I want this is going to hold my piece right like that. So now this face of my 45 degree miter is 90 degrees to the table. So all I have to do is come in with my biscuit joiner and it's going to be perfect. Except for one thing. It's coming out 5 16 off the plate. See the bottom from the bottom of the plate to the cutter is only 5 16 of an inch. And if that's the case, I'm going to be right about here. And that's going to be a pretty, that's going to be too close to the end or the point. So I want to bring that in about a quarter of an inch so that my biscuit is coming into this area. And to do that, I'm just going to put an additional piece of material on here like this. It's a piece of quarter inch MDF. And I'm going to use this block here in a minute. To get this done, I'm going to set up a little production line. And what's nice about this is it's a fairly quick production setup. And if you had a bunch of boxes like this to make, it makes quick work of it. All right, so I'm going to set this on and get a clamp. And just clamp my, my 45 degree plate up here quickly. That's nice. Now that's not going to move. Lock that in. Now I've got my ramp all ready to rock. So I've got my cleat on here and here's, I'm going to have to put this riser right here. So that's going to bring my biscuit joiner a quarter inch higher so that that biscuit will be in the right place when I want to cut into here. Now I want to center these onto my workpiece. So I've got a square and I've already set it to the halfway point here. Let's check it out if I still have it here. We go like that. Yeah, you can see. So that's the center of my piece. So normally you go and you'd mark every one, right? But I'm going to show you a little um, way to avoid having to mark them all like that. So we're going to put this in. We'll set it into the stop. Now I'm going to bring it down until I feel that point just hit the table. Okay, that's my reference point. And it's square to the table. Now I'm going to hold this and get a clamp on it. And so we're going to lock this in. And what I'm going to do is bring my plate up. You know, this is the old biscuit joiner. It's not nearly as precision as the domino. If you have a domino, you know what I'm talking about. But you have this big wide red line. So we're going to center it in that line, our point. Because we want to just center all the biscuits on our ends. So this is already set, this stop here. All of my pieces are the same. I'm flipping them around. Everyone's in the center. So I can actually take a little stop with my joiner set up like this. I'm going to take this little stop I'm centered and I'm going to put it right there on the side of my biscuit joiner. And holding that, I'll get my pin nailer. I've got one inch pins in here. And that'll hold it. And it also goes through the quarter inch. So now I've got it all set up. All I have to do is set my biscuit joiner in place here and just push right forward. So I'll do a couple of these and I'll show you just how fast it is and how worth it it was to set up this production system. This would work better with a quick clamp here. You could find a lot of ways to make this sophisticated. All right, that's one. Here we go again. Here we go. You were getting it in the center every time. And one more. Now we're going to move over here. I've already cut these panels 
to size and I'm just using this Baltic birch quarter inch or six millimeter and I'm going to decide which I want to face out if it's got a little curvature all right that'll be out and this one yeah let's put that that'll be out too and I don't really have a top and bottom yet because they're all pretty much the same what we're going to do is put the spline see I'm I had that biscuit cutter set at the lower depth I mean the, the thinner one so I'm using the thinnest uh, biscuit which is the 10 I think it's the 10 to 15 and the 20 so I'm going to just put it in first on the ends of each so let's go ahead and glue this baby up here we go we'll just put a little line in here Joseph's Once asking again. if you've ever met Norm uh no Joe I, I I almost did I was at a trade show out in Las Vegas uh what was that what was it two years three almost, years ago yeah. anyway um he was there and but there was a line of people to see him and I was like man I don't want to meet him that way anyway I just thought I'd bump into him at some point but it never happened so Someday, Norm and I will reminisce. <laughs> well, he's way before me. But here we go. I'm just going to go ahead. This will simplify things if I can set the biscuit in one side. Oh, I don't want too much squeeze out there. And just wipe it on the edge of your bench. <laughs> the next one. Or your apron. That one, I didn't put as much on that one. That's good. There you go. That's the proper amount. All right, so these are going to help index everything. It's very good practice to do a dry run to put this thing together. Like right now, it, I could glue those in, and then I could put it together and make sure it's all going to work out, right? I think the panels are the right size to go in. I want to put some glue in the grooves too, so that the panels will apply some strength and there'll be no moving around of those. So I'm just putting a thin bead right on this edge. I'll put one down each edge. Just move right along here now I'm using type on three so it gives you a little bit of open time this isn't a huge glue up so um, it won't shouldn't be a problem now I'm gonna put some glue in this slot these slots and keep moving because the glue doesn't wait for any man or woman <laughs> And in this one. Gary's saying that he tried this on a larger box using biscuits, and the biscuits swelled and prevented the miters from closing. So he had to cut it up. Ooh. You ever had that happen? Um, no, I didn't show you, but I always test the biscuits, like, before, and I, which I did on these already. I'll take them, and I'll test them, make sure they slide easily. Not sloppily, but easily you can feel it. So I sand them on this because they come, they're not, I do it with dominoes too. I make sure the dominoes are not going to be a fight because every now and then, but the dominoes are more consistent. Uh, you just have to sand off the little rib on the edge of the dominoes and usually you're good. But always check that because it's weird how you can get a fat biscuit and it can screw you up like, uh, like I think probably happened to you. So I'll move as fast as I can here. That way when they swell, it's not enough. You've already checked them. And it's not enough to hold it from going together. But that's a good experience to cut it up and learn that way. Just get a little on the miter as well. Why not? That's what you were thinking, right? I was. Um a little on the biscuit. <laughs> now the biscuit's going to start to swell. Oh no. And then a little on the underneath. <laughs> and lastly, 
All this talking about biscuits making me hungry. Um, now we're going to take, this is an out, outside surface, so I'm going to face it to the outside there and set this in the groove and get it about even there. I'll get the other panel in too and put that one in that side. Now I'm going to pick up here and set this down onto this biscuit and then guide the panels into the grooves. So what's nice is this starts to kind of lock together. I had a couple questions about what's going to happen when you t cut the top. Aren't you going to see the biscuit? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll have to veneer it or something. <laughs> All right, so you just fit this right in nice and easy, just like this. Oh, man, that was a little snug. I almost had a moment there. All right, now, the last one, you got to make sure you're not too tight here or it won't go. Mike's curious if uh, about pre-finishing pre the parts before assembly. Is that something you uh, would consider? You could. I don't do that a lot, Mike, but um, it's, it depends on the situation, you know. If it really benefits, oh, there, I'm um, relieved. It, look at that. Yeah, that's a good point about the biscuit show. <laughs> I forgot all about that. So, whatever. I don't know what I'll do. I think I'd have to veneer over it. Just a piece of cherry, simply. So, I'm going to use these. Um, I love these clamps. I mean, for quick grips, they offer a lot of strength. So I'm just going to put these, they got nice big pads right in the middle. I'm just going to very lightly touch it, just in case you're asking. They're the Easy S, this size is 45.8. We'll put a link to it. So I'm just going to just touch that one. Now I can bring this in and get it out to the end a little bit. And just also just touch this one. And then here. So I get them all kind of in position. And so now I'll just touch it and then I'll just lightly snug this one a little more and then come over to these two, do the same. And see that it's kind of closing up evenly. That one's nice. But so nice with the biscuits in there, you know you're not gonna overkill it and it's not going off like that. So that was the reassuring feeling I had when making the walnut tray, which was nice. Now, I'm gonna set that aside over here and out of the oven, I'm gonna get another box that I did a little earlier and check it out. It's pretty nice, huh? This one had a little sapwood on it. But I want to use this to demonstrate um, putting in now the splines this way, which will also reinforce the joint. I mean, seriously, though, with that biscuit in there and that good miter, I don't think the joint's... The joint is fine, right? It's going to be more than fine as it is. But before we go to... Um, cut our, our little splines on, I'm going to level this. Let me see if I got this set right. I just want to level these up a little bit. I meant to align those a touch better when I glued it up, but no problem. Let's turn it this way. I was going against the grain a touch there. So, this one will go this way. I made this box out of some blotchy cherry I had hanging around for a while. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. All the, thing, all the pieces of my house are blotchy cherry. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Nice and uh, so we go till get that nice and smooth, and yeah, let's just do. Uh, so just take a minute. 
I know some of you might have spotted and admired my new Lee Nielsen plane back here. The 102. Yeah, the number 102 brass. Look at the difference. This is the one I, I this is really a useful um, block plane. But this one, I've always loved the look of it. And it's going to get like a nice patina on there as time goes on. But the way you hold this one, it's like it gets encapsulated in your hand and you cup it right in there. It's almost like an extension of your hand. So I haven't tuned it up yet, but I'm excited to have it. It's great for little detailing, like cutting edges. So that's going to have a place in the cabinet because that's a starting lineup. All right, so that's all good except for this one last corner. Now, for the splines on the corners, I'm just going to use the table saw. You can do a lot. You can do that with a lot of methods. You can you can use a um, a wing cutter, like on a on a router table. Like here's a quarter inch wing cutter, and you would cut across the corner in this way. You know, you could have it set in the router table with a 45 degree uh, fence to push it through. And you could always want to back up this cut because this wing cutter would be blowing out the fibers here. So you want to back up those fibers there. Now, I'm going to do it the simplest way, I think. Well, one of them. And that's on the table saw. And I'm just going to cut with the saw curve. So I've already prepared a little bit of ebony to the thickness of the saw curve, which is usually right about an eighth of an inch. But what I do is first make a saw cut in something and then go ahead and uh, size your material until your spline is fitting nicely in there. So this is a piece left over from the walnut serving tray. And I'm just gonna use that to demonstrate this. But everything's flush now, the corner's nice and we're ready to go. So let's head over to the table saw and we'll go ahead and cut these. Now, I've got another little jig over here. To make this, I started out with a, a half inch piece of Baltic birch ply. You use whatever, but it's nice to have a little bedding there. And then I just grabbed these chunks of uh, cherry. I had like a little off cut and made a 45 degree miter on each one and then with the cutoff on each of them, I had a little, an extra 45 degree block. So I just glued that down and then uh, the block in behind it. So you're left with a nice little jig. You gotta be careful though, if you're gonna nail it together, not to nail it where you might be splining. So this worked out well for that, for that box. But here, you notice I got a piece of quarter inch MDF on this side. This is the back side to prevent that blowout like I was mentioning a second ago. So this will hold it in there nicely so that our box when it gets set in there at the at the 90 hits and now it's right up against the fence here and I tacked an additional piece on here just as a stop to hold it because the fence isn't high enough and the piece would wobble a little bit. But once it's in there, it's nested in a nice little cradle holding it at the 45 degree angle. I am going to now make this cut, but I've got to decide like how large I want the, um, the splines on the corners. So, you know, this is a pretty healthy piece. If you measure across the diagonal, it's about, it's a good inch. So um, I think if we come up on the sides, I don't want it too big, but a three quarter inch spline would be pretty gracious, I'd say. So I'm going to use this as a test piece just to get the depth. And once we've got a three quarter inch depth, I'll use that. So I think I mentioned, but I went, the reason I put this MDF backer on was to prevent the blow up, but also, because once you start running grooves, you're gonna kind of mess up the back. So you can just refresh it every now and then with another piece until it's unstable. It has to go to the farm. All right, here we go.
slow. That was too deep. All right, that looks good. Now into the cradle. I could stop there, but I think I'll put a middle one as well. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was, for this you want to have a flat bottom on your kerf cut. You know, a lot of saw blades have that little angular and they leave a little peak in the middle the way they're ground. Uh, this is ground at the num this is the number one grind with on your table saw blades, which leaves a flat raker tooth in every other every third tooth so it cleans out and gives you that flat bottom you can buy them that way i think you'd specify that's how you want them ground but it would probably maybe it would cost you more but um, i get these most of my blades i get from ridge carbide so i'm going to move this over to where it's centered which is about an inch and a quarter and make that quick last cut and we'll get some splines in how about that here we go So I'm just going to set this in the vise and we're going to check and see if our spline is fitting a little, excuse me, a little snug that way. All right. So I'm just going to use the sandpaper. It doesn't take much, but it takes more than that. <laughs> It's not as snug. It's a little tighter than I thought. Okay, that'll fit. Good. Now, once I've got that seated, I want to get it down so it's all the way seated. I'm going to draw on there a little pencil line. You can actually see the lead on, on ebony. And that'll be, let's call that one. One will be away from me. Let's go ahead and see about, oh boy. They're, they're closing up on me. All right, here we go. On the walnut, it was the perfect. All right, so here we go. That fits good. I'm gonna set this. Seat it right down, make another pencil line. We'll call this two. Now see you can kind of flip it around every time. Yeah, that one fits nice. Actually a little loose. Should have made that two. Yeah, two's tight. Okay. 
and this will be three. All right, so let's head over to the bandsaw and cut those off. Here we go. So let's set them up here, make sure they fit nicely before we start throwing glue in there. That's one. Oh, three cracked. I, I thought that might happen. I have a little check in this. Uh, two is the Snuggie. Let's see, maybe this will, they should all be the same size. I think. So two needs to be sanded a touch more. Very strange. There it is. All right, so now I'm gonna just get my little goo bottle and I need a stick. Here we go. John's asking how do other materials react to wood if you don't use wood? Does that make sense? Um, like brass, you could use brass blinds here. Um, they've been popular for inlays for centuries. Um, but I think that, is that what you mean? Um, is that what you mean, John? Wood move, like wood's moving. So a lot of materials don't move like wood does. So, you know, you have to consider that. Um, you know, stone is sometimes used. Um, so you want to, if you're going to do a larger inlay with some other material that does not move like wood, you'd have to do it over perhaps a um, stable substrate. So the wood is on something more like you've maybe veneered over plywood or something like that. All right, so we bring that down in, press it all the way down. Yeah, he meant abalone or brass, he said. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure how... But usually brass, there's small inlays and you don't have to worry about it. Like, I would do this in brass and glue it in with epoxy and it would be fine. It would look pretty nice. But it's a larger area that you might have to be concerned about. So, there. See how that's snug, more snug with the glue in there? But make sure it's seated on the corners. This third one, I'm going to get a little glue. I don't like that that broke, but it shouldn't be a problem. Get a little glue right in there. Make sure I get this properly aligned. Set that right in, and then come on in with the little piece. Quick fix on the run. What's that? Quick fix on the run. Yeah. It's not, no one's ever going to see that one. <laughs> but that's a nice thing, uh, Ebony. So you just, the main thing here is just make sure they're fully seated. And once they're in there, just a minute, couple minutes, they're, they're pretty solid. Let me get my my rag and so my... you think that the reason the glue in the middle one was a little tight was because of the... I mean, the one in the middle was a little tight was because of the glue? I think if you let that glue really dry first, you'd get more uniformity when you're fitting them in. There's no... It's not like it was going to be closing up a lot, so I don't understand. But I'm just going to clean off a little of the glue here. And then I'm going to grab my block plane again. We are going to flush these up. Uh, isn't that cool looking? Now I'm going to use my low angle block plane here. I don't think they're going to move at all anymore. I'm not putting much stress this way. So the grain is running out this way. So I want a plane 
with the grain so it's nice because you can just go downhill like that just till you get flush now do you choose to use splines because it's decorative or for strengthening or both uh, both I don't I honestly don't do this a lot I don't I don't make a lot of boxes and but I have made picture frames where it's nice because if you're going to put a miter and you want to just glue up your miter well, I'm going against the grain there a little bit um, you can just glue up your miter and then throw in the splines um, and you're you've got something really nice and durable so let's turn this around hit this one If you cut these really close, you don't have much to do here. Oh, that piece is moving a little bit. <laughs> Jeez. Should have let it sit longer. Wasn't happy. No, it's not. It's moving, so I'm going to let that one sit for a second. That little piece I glued in, I, I could have put more. Do you have a favorite um, species or color of wood? I love... you think make the best combinations oh that's a good question I'm I'm not usually big on strong contrast um, so even the ebony into the walnut is not a strong contrast but that's a personal preference really I mean it was pretty really quite popular in the 18th century to you know put satin wood which is kind of like a golden white wood against mahogany and really be quite a bright contrast but uh, I don't know I like woods that complement each other I remember one time I was with Pug and uh, I don't know if we were looking at a table or something and he made the comment he his favorite wood was walnut which I would say is probably mine too it's probably like the American exotic wood you know if you're in other countries and you could get walnut you go wow that's a desirable wood because it's it's really nice to work and it has a beautiful color and it gets an awesome patina over time uh, but he mentioned how much he liked the combination of walnut with white oak and I I always think of that when I put those together because white oak has a um, kind of a a golden almost like a hay uh, color to it when it's you know I always think of like fresh like hay blowing out there it's kind of whitish golden you know it's um, tan like and the way it me meshes or complements the brown and the the golden colors in in walnut it's just it's a contrast but they are in the same kind of family and they really look sweet together. So I often look for that. Like if I'm using complement, contrasting woods, I like them to complement each other to some degree. So it's a pleasing kind of composition, you know? Uh, so then we'll just hit this with a little card scraper. It's just... That's nice and flush. Then you can come on in with a little sandpaper. Of course, you'd be doing this all around the whole box. Then you break that edge a little bit so everything's not so sharp. There you go. Then you put your finish on and it would look Sort of like this. And it jumps out. And it gives kind of a class and elegance to a fairly plain box. You know, throw it in those ebony splines. Someone sees that thing. Oh, yes, those are ebony. There you have it. Let's get our, our tray back over. So you can see these are a little more discreet here, uh, but you come in and you see them and you can see how you've got those dark black spots and circles on the burl and how that does relate nicely to the ebony 
splines on the edge. So this is a, another composition which utilized the exact same technique I just showed you. Internal spline aided and strengthened the corner. I um, mean, aided the glue up and strengthened the corner. And then the decorative and functional splines put in after the fact. Any tips just for like cutting that. off the top? A lot of times I do a cut like that on the table saw. So I'd have a piece of this material and make the cut on the table saw set the height of the blade so it's just shy of cutting through okay so and you can do that with your test piece so you're making sure it's coming up but it's not quite penetrating all the way through the thickness of your sides and you'll make one cut two three when you get to that fourth cut if you had sawn all the way through, you've got kind of a shaky situation there. And it's really hard not to squeeze that on the blade. But by not going all the way through, even though it's thin, it gives you that rigidity to make that final cut. And then I just take a, a veneer saw and I just have it right in the crack. And I make a very light, very light pass like this. I don't know if you heard this story, but this one kills me every time I think of it. When I was with Pug, I shared with him a video of someone who made a tool cabinet. You know, it was big like this. He said, oh, that was really nice. Um, he said, I think I'm going to make a tool cabinet like that. You know, and he had, he had one, but he wanted something for all his chisels and things like that. And so he just kind of dovetailed the corners and made a big box out of, I think it was poplar. And didn't care, you know he didn't make it fancy he made it functional but it was fancy in its own way he got it all glued up sort of like this you know with the the front and the back and all that so you had the box and now it's time to cut it apart and at some point right before that he's like hey tom have you seen my hammer we're looking around for his hammer and then he goes he grabs his the box oh, and he no. goes shifts it and he is clunk 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 <laughs> So now he's like, oh my, oh my gosh. All right. So he had to saw through now the box with the hammer inside. So it was like each time we rotate it, go, 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 and shake it over to one side. And, but we did that and made sure that the blade was just shy of the material. So you went through all the way and then you could cut it. And sure enough, the hammer was inside. I, to this day, I have no idea how... He managed to do that one, but that was one of the great. Can, can you talk about the finish on the, the walnut tray? Tom's asking. Sure, I can talk for a minute about it. I just used a, um, I've talked about this method a few times with walnut. I put a, uh, I mixed up some wax-free orange shellac and I got it to a pound and a half cut and I sprayed it on. So I got a pretty nice sealer on there. And then I lightly knocked it down with 320 paper. And then I took a glazing stain because they wanted that nice color. It, it enriches it. And I used burnt umber. I added a touch of Van Dyke brown because it, it seemed a little too red. But that's optional. It would have been okay to leave it. Um, and then that after that coat of glaze, glazing stain, you wipe most of it off but it leaves a nice stain but because you've sealed it with the shellac it doesn't you know it doesn't block out or create like an opaque finish then i sprayed another coat of the orange wax-free shellac same pound and a cut, half cut and that sealed it so then i lightly uh steel willed it, um hit that yeah steel willed it and then I hit the final coat with a lacquer. So this is actually just a Watco lacquer. I was setting up for a spray gun and I had some, some lacquer. Is this right? Good? Yeah, just hold it still. Okay. Somebody, somebody's asking for a close up of the handles. Is the glare too much? No, just hold it still. Okay. I'll move around you. Okay. I'll turn it a little bit so you can see this side. So, um, and then after that, that was a semi-gloss in the Waco. So you can get that at Walmart and uh, Home Depot, but 
you know, if, if you got a small project, it's not worth like setting up a big spray gun and not all that. You can really do a nice job of it. I wish the spray pattern was wider. It's very narrow. So you gotta, you gotta move your hand. You should practice before doing this because if you stay too long, it's gonna pull up. But it leveled out just beautifully out of that spray can. So I was impressed with it. I mean, I would get the same results off of a good gun. Um, but it worked out really nicely. So that's going to give a harder, more protective finish there. I could have used an oil varnish. You know, that would have been a lot of time. And then I always feel like when you're going to be sanding into corners, it's kind of a pain if you're going to have to wipe, you know, rub it out at all. But there's very little rubbing out on this. I'm just going to very lightly hit it with maybe some 2000 paper to knock any light dust nibs off won't affect the sheen and I'll have a nice looking nice looking tray good good finish so that's the reddish color in the burn umber is a nice complement to the browns already existing in the walnut awesome yeah so that it for questions no, we're good. I forgot to mention hey if you like this content consider subscribing. It helps us. But if you want to go deeper with us and be an insider of sorts, go to our website at epicwoodworking.com and sign up on the mailing list. We look forward to seeing you again next time right back here.